So my talk is called, Who Cares What the Buddha Looked Like? I think it was in April that I, uh, I agreed to give a talk. And about a week later, I was asked for the title and the summary. I'd much rather write a talk and then decide on the title and the summary, but that doesn't work for copy deadlines. Um, so here I am trying to give the talk that I probably would have liked to have listened to in April. Um, it's definitely still an area in progress, but it's, um, I can just describe a part of that journey, basically. Um, and as you may be able to tell from the title, I, <laughs> I think I was trying to be a bit edgy, to be honest. I'm not entirely sure that worked. Uh, the thing that was on my mind was what do you do as a Buddhist, as someone who is committing to live their life in line with the teachings of the Buddha, and incidentally, who enjoys engaging with myth and symbol and ritual, when you look at a visual representation of the historical Buddha, Shakyamuni, and quite frankly, you just feel a bit flat. Can you even be a Buddhist? And you know, we surround ourselves with Buddha figures we regularly make ritual offerings to them. We visualize them in our meditations. What do you do when this image doesn't naturally inspire you? And yes, logically, I know that the Buddha Rupa is a symbol of the enlightened human mind, of our ultimate potential. I understand that. But it doesn't touch my heart. It doesn't move me. It's still, for me, firmly located in the conceptual. So I thought that to try and unpack that a bit, perhaps I'd start with what does move and inspire me. And um, what came to mind really quickly, this is going to sound cheesy, I'm sorry, it was the moon. Um, without fail, whenever I catch sight of the moon, in any phase, it doesn't have to be full, whether I'm expecting to see it or whether I'm deliberately looking for it, I feel a sense of connection. I get like a little tremor of excitement. And more often than not, I'll, I'll find this little tug to put my hands to my heart and just give a little bow. Actually, sometimes I get that with the sunrise too. And I feel connected to something vast and wonderful. I'm stilled by that awe. And in those moments, my bones know truths that my mind can only begin to understand in the space between words. The quality of that experience is hugely expansive and liberating. I am gifted with a perspective on my life that lifts me above and beyond all the grit and detail, above the interpersonal, and beyond a need or a desire for any particular outcome to my existence. And that is an experience that I just don't get when I look at a picture of the Buddha. So at this point, I'd like to say that I know it's an error to take the aesthetic dimension too literally. And when Subhuti says in his paper, Reimagining the Buddha, to live the Buddhist life, to become like the Buddha, we must imagine the Buddha, He's not suggesting that if I can mentally conjure an accurate texture of the Buddha's robe or perfectly outline of his shaven head, that I am somehow then living a life in line with reality. I know that. But what role does visual language play here? Well, I could guess that the image of the Buddha may inspire us to reflect on certain noble qualities, perhaps those of stillness, simplicity, contentment, kindness, compassion, wisdom. And these are critical areas of development in an effective Buddhist life. But at least to begin with, they're still concepts, right? That's not to say it's not helpful to have a recipe if you want to make a cake. A list of qualities that moves the practitioner towards liberation is as essential as a list of ingredients before you start heating the oven. But I realize I'm not much moved by the idea of an improved human experience. I've got this human experience, which is totally valid, hugely rich, and contains more than enough lessons for one lifetime, thank you very much. It has its own potential, 
a natural trajectory, which might seem a bit cyclical at times, but I trust and respect it. And at the end of the day, it's limited, even in its own winding adventures. So I'm looking to move beyond the human experience, through it, okay, I guess, but beyond it and out into something else. So I might think of the human image, image of Shakyamuni Buddha as a way marker, a place name on a map, but the map is not the territory. And I want to spend as little time as possible looking at the map. I would like to be out there in the landscape, preferably sunburnt, windswept and barefoot. Anyway, it seemed fortuitous for this talk, but probably the reason I was chewing over the problem at all, that I wound up on the Mythic Context Retreat at Tiratna Loka last month. And on that retreat, the focus is on this slightly bonkers meditation practice in which you visualise a whole family tree of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas and Dharma teachers and regularly perform full-length prostrations to them. So you can imagine how I felt about that. Anyway, in the study material, Arloka says in his paper, the refuge tree is mythic context, that the way the figures on the refuge tree appear tells us more, probably, about us than it does about them. The way the figures on the refuge tree appear tells us more about us, probably, than it does about them. Well, as soon as I read that, of course, this question dropped in. What does the way the figures appear to me tell me about myself? Why do certain figures feel more inspiring to me than others? And I realised that the ones that I have a connection with are the least human. So we've got Tara, who regularly turns up to the party either green or with a profusion of eyes in impractical places. <laughs> There's the thousand-armed Avalokiteshvara, who's certainly got more limbs and heads than the guy at the checkout in front of you buying his cake ingredients. And there's Pranyo Paramitar, who admittedly has a fairly human-looking goddess form, but as a manifestation of the perfection of wisdom sutras is basically a book. <laughs> so if I feel cold looking at human figures, even enlightened ones, does that in fact speak of my inherent discomfort with humans? Because... I'm not comfortable with humans. I mean, you're all totally lovely and everything, but could you go and be totally lovely over there, please? <laughs> I mean, what human doesn't really, at the crux of it all, have a bit of a problem with other humans? Or at least find them a little bit difficult. Am I alone here? You're all supposed to be nodding now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like, I love you, but not when you do that. <laughs> I want to be near you, but leave me the hell alone. <laughs> I rejoice in your company and I'm grateful for your assistance in a variety of situations, but I also find you totally frustrating and I'm frequently irritated by the way you breathe in meditation. And wh what's worse is I appear to be one of these humans, which is complicated. And quite honestly, it's a little bit unpleasant and vaguely embarrassing. So suddenly there's this whole knotty mess and I'm confronted with the harsh truth that being human is problematic. It's messy, it's confusing, it's painful as often as it is joyous, it's difficult, unsatisfying, and often rather terrifying. So could it be that when I stand before an image of the historical Buddha, what actually happens is that I'm challenged with the problem of being human? And I am challenged, because implicated in that by the very person of the Buddha is the truth that if I step up and truly face embrace even, all that it is to be fully human, then it becomes possible to stretch beyond it. Not ignore it, not distract myself from it, not bypass it, but become it and realise my total humanness. So perhaps I unearthed a large part of the problem. But does that solve it? Does it even begin to address it? Of course not. Not in the sense that I suddenly get fired up by emotionally engaged pictures of the Buddha in the same way that as I do like a moon or a sunrise. But it does bring me into relationship with it and it opens up a dialogue. 
and what's relationship and dialogue if it isn't a kind of connection? And if an image of the Buddha connects me to the existential problem of being human, perhaps it connects me to the space where the sense of separation between this tricky human experience and the tricky experiences of all the humans out there is met with kindness and the possibility of loosening. And Sabuti also says that we need to discover what the Buddha looks like to us. We need to find the Buddha in our own imaginations and allow his image to express itself in forms that we can respond to with every aspect of our being. He says, we require specific images that are accessible to us within our own imaginations, yet that are illumined from beyond our self-clinging. So that's kind of where I've got to in processing my question. And I find I need to put the human in a wider context. And it's a context that speaks the language of my heart and guts. And I need to zoom out a bit from the individual human, from the man sitting in meditation, because I don't really care what you look like. But if I think about a human, a human, because where we're going ultimately transcends gender, right? So a human, on the night of the full moon, at Beltane, sitting under the spreading limbs of a great tree, and after eons of lifetimes of burgeoning compassion, of countless lives lived in the service of love for the benefit of all life, who in being witnessed in this by the earth goddess, so overcomes all the human fears, distractions and doubts sees through the self-made illusion of separation and realises complete and irreversible liberation. That moves me. Yeah. Oh, I'm still a Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to end just by saying, please don't give up on the quest to find the seeds of your Bodhi tree. Find the image, the myth, and symbol that lights up your heart and guts beyond your normal understanding. And I guarantee you have one. You can trust me that because you wouldn't be sitting in this tent if you didn't. Find your pole star, set your compass to it, hoist your sail into the winds of the Dharma and launch yourself onto the great ocean of the beyond. <laughs>